well, okay, folks. We need to have called in, what, maybe an intercession? I'm not for sure what that is, but nonetheless, we just dismiss everybody for about 15 minutes while you go get a cup of coffee or go do whatever you need to do while I put things together up here. And uh, the music stopped. <laughs> the music stopped. Well, we'll continue. We will continue nonetheless. Now, Basically, I'll be talking with you today concerning our relation, well, concerning our relation to Christ and then concerning our relationship with Christ but there's, there's basically two, two portions of Scripture that I want to deal with uh, and, and, and gather. Uh, and gather our relationship with Christ and what that all means. Gather that into, uh, to some degree, these, these two verses. Uh, these two verses. I came up here yesterday. Now, you who are with us by internet, you're welcome this morning. May the Lord bless you. And uh, I came up here yesterday, and I was I was up here all day long and until pretty late last night, looking at what I want to share with you today and try to get that done in an hour. Now, it was something that I wanted to be, it is something I wanted to take place in me, an understanding that I would, that I desire to have. But it's an understanding that can only be given of the Spirit of God in the revealing of the indwelling Son of God. Well, the Son of God dwells in me and in you. If you are born again, consequently, if you're His body and Christ is in you, what a tremendous thing. And I just want to... I just, I just want everyone that is listening or that will listen. I just want us to come to an understanding of our relation with the Son of God as only the Father can reveal that by His Holy Spirit. Now, folks, see, to me, that is extremely important to understand. To me, I mean, that's the thing that makes, that makes me tick. That's the thing that's the thing that I, that I get up thinking about, going to bed thinking about, and drive down the road thinking about, and that's the reason I get lost so many times. Well, that's all right. There are no interstate 40s in Texas or in, <laughs> in Christ. And that's where my mind stays a lot of times. Particularly when I understand or I, I, can, I, can, 
I, I can sense, I can know that the spirit of truth who is come is desiring to work in me. Work in me. How? Work in me through what he does. Jesus said he takes of mine and shows it unto you. And there is that, there is that desire, there is that, that unction of the Holy Spirit to do that. And where does he do that? Well, he has to do that in the vessel given of God. He has to do that in the believer. He has to do that in those who have received Christ. So let's look at these two verses and then just see how that relates us to the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 6, 1 through 12. One of the most tremendous, in my opinion, one of the most tremendous chapters, we'll call it, in the book of Romans, in the, in the letter written by Paul, it's Romans 6. And Romans 6 is where we find the phrase that I want you to look at in verse 4. It, it's just the heart of Romans 6. Now, let's look at that. I'll read it. Romans 6, beginning with verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul is speaking here, obviously, <clears throat> to define the grace of God. To define the grace of God. And I may want to look at that with you here in just a few minutes. I got up this morning looking at it. Paul is here defining the grace of God. It, it, he does it, if you'll, you'll read in chapter 5 of that, of that letter, uh, chapter 5, and then bring that right on into chapter 6 through chapter 7 into chapter 8. All of them are gathered up to really say one thing. I mean, to really bring a definition to one thing given of God, and that's grace. And here Paul then begins to show that Christ himself is actually, and I'd sure like to look at that, he is actually the definition, Christ, not only the definition, but the person and the spirit of grace. Well, let's read here. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. God forbid. Because what he's facing here with this letter, and he knows who is writing it to it, he's been faced with them in some situations evidently, but it's the way Paul writes. So what he's actually saying is, what do you think grace is and how do you think grace is given of God or why do you think that God gives you grace based upon how much you go out and sin? 
Is that what you believe? Because he had said that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. But hon, when he said that, he's talking about Christ, in Christ. The sin that Christ took upon himself at the cross, and there sin abounded. You know where sin abounded extremely abounded, excessively abounded sin. Where? At the cross. How? Because Christ took upon himself the sin of mankind. Ever mankind. All. Mankind, his intention and he and what he did in that was that he took it to death. But he had to do that. He didn't run and jump on the cross without him. I didn't run and jump on the cross without him, and you didn't either, dear heart. I went there in him. He went there. As me, as you, as all mankind. Somewhere in all of this, I would read it to you. Now I'm thinking about it, so I'll just say it. In Philippians, where it says, let, let this mind be in you. Let this understanding be in you, which was also in Christ. What understanding? Well, the understanding that he made manifest when he who was equal with God, laid that aside, took upon himself, this is in Philippians chapter 2, folks, verse 5, took upon himself the form of a man, my form, your form, our form, took upon himself mankind. Why did he do that? Well, he did that so he might be obedient unto death. Not just obedient unto dying, not getting sick and not getting over it and getting sick and dying. No. 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 Another death altogether. A death that swallows up death. A death that brings death to an absoluteness and to an end. A death that only the Son of God Himself could die. Isn't that something, hon? We're baptized into that. We're baptized into a death that we could never die, but that he died as us so that we may have a life that we can never live so that he may live in us as our life. My word. What a wonderful thing. What a wonderful thing. Well, that's the grace of God. That is the grace of God. In fact, what we're going to be talking about here this morning and everything is the grace of God. So he says, what should we say then? You just need to go out and sin a whole lot? No, that's not, that's not the way it works that grace may abound? No. Back to the cross. Back to the cross. Where sin abounded, right there, Christ took all of it that there was, that there had ever been or was ever going to be. See, that's... <laughs> that doesn't even register in my natural, my, my natural brain. but it does register in my soul. I was reading the other day how that our salvation and the grace of God by our salvation saved to the utmost. My word. That goes all the way to the end of time if there is such a thing. 
the utmost. Not only speaking of people scattered around throughout all of the world, but it's to the utmost in you. Nothing is left out. Nothing is not dealt with. Nothing in you that is not touched. Nothing. Well, at the cross, sin abounded, and Christ suffered it in himself. But where sin abounded, right there at the cross, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And the, and the greatness, the greatest work, the greatness of grace, the greatest work of grace took place in the person of grace himself, took place in the cross. Through his death and his burial. All of that summed up and dealt with in his resurrection. And it is that Christ, yes, who was dead, he says that himself. He says, I am he that liveth, was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death, of Hades. I am alive forevermore. That's the one that lives in you. That's the one, hon, who is our life. And that's the one in whom and as whom the grace of God abounds. Where does the grace of God abound? In Christ. In the one who is the grace of God, the one who has made perfect the grace of God, the one who has given the grace of God fullness as a measure. So the grace of God is measured by the fullness of Christ. And it pleases the Father that in Christ all fullness dwells. What am I doing, honey? I'm not running around the, the tree on you. What I'm saying is that everything that is given to us of God is a gift of grace. Why? How? How? Because everything that is given of God is in Christ. Not something in Christ that is in addition to Christ, but that which is in Christ that he is the fullness of. Christ is the fullness of love. Is love given of God? It's given of God in his Son. And it's that son I want to talk to you about in a moment, if we can get there, in his son. No, there is nothing God has given to you, friends, nothing that God has given to you, nothing that is not in his son. Let me put it this way, that his son is not the reality of, the person of, the substance of, the fullness of. Has God given you joy? Well, you see, that's not some momentary moment. That is the joy of God's heart that he has given to you. And that is the son who dwells in you, who is the very joy of God. The son 
who facing the cross, suffering the shame, yes, becoming all that Adam was, becoming all that you and I was, becoming all of that, the shame of it coming up on him that all was all over us, that shame came upon him, and yet he did that in obedience, looking forward to the joy that should be revealed in him. Looking to the joy. Looking to the joy. Oh, his joy, his joy is fulfilled in who he is and to his obedience to the Father. That very son that did die was buried, but that was raised up out from among the dead by the glory of the Father for one purpose, and that is to now dwell in you and in me, to dwell in those who will receive him, to fulfill the desire of the Father's heart. For the Father who created all things desired a new creation in Christ, a creation wherein wherein. All things are of God. Therefore, he brings us to be in union with his son. And that's why Paul says in the scripture so many times, but in the case where he says in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, ah, from verse 14, 15, 16, and in verse 17, any man... If any man be, and that simply means or profoundly means, if any man have being, if any man has his being in Christ, and we do, if you are born from above, if you have received Christ, if any man be in Christ, has his being in Christ. He is a new creation. What does that possibly mean? Because, hon, in the last two days, the Lord has just, oh, well, in the last two days, I've been confronted with this in my own heart and soul. And it just comes to me. Do you do you really understand? Is the focus of your mind, of your heart, JW, is the focus of it? Not not so much away from something, but is the focus of it into a reality? Are you under Are you living in the understanding of that reality? Is that reality determining what's important to you? And he's talking about that reality, a new, if any man be in Christ. Well... You you can't change that because because Christ makes, makes it what it is. If any man be in Christ, he is a he is a new creation. You realize that, huh? A new creation is something that comes. Well, a new creation is what comes to the comes to the death of the cross and comes forth out from among the dead by the resurrection of the Son. A new creation is just that. It's not something made better, made over. No person that is part of a new creation is something made better 
reformed. This is a reformed creation. Well, then it wouldn't be in Christ. No. That's the reason Paul says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. How so? Because the new is come. That's, that is the much better translation. Behold, he makes all things new. Well, he does, but that's because the new himself is come. And he is the newness of life that I want us to look at here. Maybe we'll get to verse 4 if we keep on. Verse 3, know ye not, that's Romans 6, hon. It's taken us into newness of life. We said, where does grace abound? It abounded on the cross. Where was, where did, where was sin shown? Where was sin revealed? Where was sin uncovered? In the Son Himself. But where did grace abound over sin? Through the resurrection. Consequently, in the cross. God forbid, how shall we, verse 2, God forbid. What are we going to run out and see how much we can sin so that we can say, oh, well, God will give grace. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? My Lord, know you not? Here's the problem. Do you not understand one translation calls it, are you so ignorant? Do you not understand that so many of us, in other words, all of us, all of us who have come to Christ and were baptized into Jesus Christ, we're not talking about baptized into water. We're talking about being baptized by the Spirit of God into the Son. It's a it's not something you sit down and look at. It's something that takes place in your soul. You don't really see anybody getting born again either, do you? I mean, you see them repenting. You see them crying. Yeah, you can watch that. You see yourself. But new birth, hunt is something that the Spirit of God does in you. It's not a flesh. It is of spirit. It is a work of the Spirit of God, and you know it when it happens. You know it when it happens. It's not you just joining something and promising to be good or promising not to ever do this or that again. No, it's more than all of that put together. It is, it is one of these terms I want us to look at and the term we're looking now at what I wanted to look at in the uh, newness of life, because that's what all of this is coming about. Therefore, buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up out from among the dead by the glory of the Father, well, even so also, even we also should walk in newness of life. Life. What happened to the oldness? It has to be reckoned dead because it died in him. He's the death of it. He took it into his own body, his own self for a reason to take it to the cross and to do away with it. See, hon, he fulfilled what under the Old Testament and under, under the Jews and Judaism and, and under the law, well, 
you had to kill something on behalf of you. Had to be some kind of a sacrifice, an animal was chosen, and all of that. Then why do you think they killed them? Well, they put their hand on it. They identified to it. They gave it to the priest, and the priest put it on the altar of death or killed it and shed its blood. But you see, all of none of that really changed that person, but it was, it was what the law said to do. In doing that, they at least kept the law. They didn't violate the law. And yet the law could not make them what the law demanded them to be. It couldn't do it. The law pointed to a greater one. And when he came, Christ came. And he came as to righteousness, as to salvation. He came as the end of the law because the law could make nothing perfect. Christ did. And you know all those things. You know all of those things. The new creation would not exist and does not exist except through our union with Christ. Otherwise, otherwise then I would simply be part of the Adamic creation. I would simply be dead in sin trying to do the best I can. There's nothing wrong with doing anything the best you can, but trying to make myself better by doing it. That's all in a natural realm, hon. There's some things you can make yourself better by doing, but none of them have anything to do with salvation. None of them have anything to do with a new creation in Christ. None of them. None of them. Now, I didn't say that those things were mean, bad, and ugly. I said they're not part of our salvation, not part of being in Christ. And yet we can do those things and be in Christ, but the doing of those things does not make us in Christ. See what I'm trying to tell you? But you can be born again. You can be born again and be real good at some vocation, at some job that you have or something that you do for a living. And yet, at some point in time, you may not have, you may retire from that job or all these other things may come to an end, but our being in Christ does not. It continues. It continues. So I can certainly be in him and do these other things. But in doing them, doing them does not mean that I am in him, hon. And we're talking about newness of life a life that can only be given to us in the person of Christ. Let me, let me just look at that for a moment. Well, before I do that, the newness of Christ, we're here with that, we're here in, we're here in Romans. We're here in Romans, but where we find the other is in Ephesians 1, 17 through 23, and it is the exceeding greatness of his power. Now, that's something that I want to talk about. I'll just mention it here this morning. It is, it is the thing that <clears throat> was on my heart <clears throat> that I mentioned as much as I could 
on the uh, on the CD for on the monthly CD for July. It has very much to do with what with what I'm sitting here talking to you about because I had the same notes in front of me then as I have now. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, Ephesians 1, chapter 1, verse 17. This is Paul's prayer for every believer. This is Paul's prayer for the believer. This is Paul's prayer for for the church, which is made up of believers. This is Paul's prayer. And he tells them it's his prayer that I am praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, in the knowledge of Christ, the Son. Doing what? The, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the, what is the, expectation that you may know the hope, the expectation of his calling, that you may know what his calling is all about. I mean, you're called for something. What is it? My prayer is that you may come to understand that. Hmm. And that you might understand what is or who is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And verse 19, and that you may know what or who, who is legitimate here, that you may know what or who is the exceeding greatness of, of his power, exceeding greatness, meaning that there is nothing nor has ever been anything, there's nothing like it, there's nothing that is greater. Nothing that God has ever exhibited was greater than than this power, than this exhibition of power or of this manifestation of power. You mean, you mean when God created Adam, that wasn't, that wasn't greater, that wasn't a greater ex- exhibition of God's power? Not than this. Well, then when he when he by his own word called the whole creation into existence. Do you not? Surely that was a greater exhibition of God's power. No, not than this. My goodness. Then what is, what is, Because Paul is saying, I'm praying for you. That he will open the eyes of your understanding and that you may know. You may know what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward. And a better better word for that, to usward, that many, many translators still use it, but it is, It is also or needs to be in us. It is something not just thrown at us, but it is something working in us. The exceeding greatness of his power in us according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from among the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. 
What is this he's talking about here, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him up? He's talking about the power of his resurrection, the power of his resurrection. So, hon, he's talking about the power of his resurrection working in you, working in me. He, he's bringing he is showing here and would have us to understand here what really happens when any believer is born from above, born again, born anew, whichever of those three you want to look at because they're all the same. And we've reduced it in the church world and in the understanding of most Christians down to that salvation that what happened to us when we were born again was that, you know, the grace of God, well, okay, certainly the grace of God. But what happened was, well, our sins are all forgiven. Well, honey, there's a lot more to it than that. Bless your heart. And Paul says, I'd like for you to know, and it's going to take, it's going to take God, it's going to take this, that he may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. It's going to take a genuine working of the spirit of God in your soul. Yes. Because it has to, it's going to have to open the eyes of your heart, the eyes of your understanding. You're going to have to come to an understanding of your relationship to the Father by the Son that you have never had nor could you ever have in a natural way, in a, by a natural understanding. I mean, you may believe it with your natural mind, with your brain, that Christ is in you, but to know him, to know him in his fullness, to know him as, as the exceeding greatness of the power of God, to know him in the power of his resurrection, to know him in the same, inwardly in the same power that it took to raise him up out from among the dead and he be seated with the Father. You, you mean that that's my God, the same power? that transforms my soul? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. But he can only open, open your eyes because it's a greatness that has never been seen with the natural eye. Even all of the miracles of Christ all of those were for reasons. Certainly there was. But honey, the greatest miracle goes beyond all of that. Now, because I'm not going to go much further with this because it needs, to be, it needs to be done again and again or it needs to be done more than just in one time. So I wrote this out. This is a summation of what I really want to say and of what I've written down here in all of this, all of this other. Huh. The exceeding greatness of his power. 
the miracle, the miracle of our union with Christ. Not a miracle that happened to you, though that's wonderful. I mean, my goodness. I'm talking about the miracle that happened in you and that continues in you until this day. And yet, so many believers have no understanding. They have no understanding because many of them have just been have been really misled. I mean, they've been hugged and kissed and given the pad and have their name written on it. Now they're a member of such and such. All right, fine, fine, good. But then they're told about, you know, 10 ways to be like Jesus and what we must do to make heaven our home. And it just gets all balled up in religion. And of course, each, each, each church division has basically its own, its own, uh, its own uh, beliefs, beliefs about salvation. Some say it must be this way. Some says it must be another way. Some says you must be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The others say, no, 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 you got to be baptized only in Jesus' name. Okay. Uh, you guys are using water in this, aren't you? Oh, yes, yes, we are. Then let me give you my opinion. Now, I'm talking to these two guys that are arguing with me about how it ought to be done. If it's done in water, then it's not done by the Spirit of God. So what difference does it make? I'm talking to you about a baptism into Christ. There is where you're baptized into his death. Now, honey, I've been baptized in water. You can call that whatever you want to. I've baptized, I can't even... I can't even, I've baptized a lot of people in different denominations, in different places. I've done that in India. I've done it in the Philippines. I've done it in Africa. I've done it. I've done it in the upper, in the upper forests of, of California. Good Lord, you go up there and get baptized. You better wear some waders because I'm telling you that water is cold. We're talking about a spiritual, a baptism with the Spirit and by the Spirit. We're talking about what John said when even he was baptizing with water and said, this one that is here now is greater than I. He is before I am, and he is greater and I baptize in water, but he shall baptize with Holy Spirit. And Paul says that it is by that very Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that has baptized us into Christ. Into Christ. It's an inward thing, hon. Our soul, our soul has been brought into a living union with baptism himself, with who is our baptism. Christ is our baptism. Who is the living water of it? Christ is the living water of it. Who is the result of it? What comes up out of it? He comes up out of it in the resurrection, and he lives in me and he lives in you. He quickens us together. He raises us together. He seats us together in himself, in heavenly places. Honey, it's not a location. It is a divine, eternal relationship which will continue 
when this natural body of mind that you can see right now is no longer here. It's gone. I mean, in whatever may, way that may take place. But darling, what you can't see sitting here the indwelling Christ, the very body of Jesus Christ, or at least part of that body. We look at each other, we don't see that body, and yet that's the body that we are. What we see is the bodies we have. No problem there, except the body that I have should serve the body that I am, which is the church, which is the body of Christ. Well, the miracle. I wonder if we realize the miracle of our union with the Father. I mean, I mean the exceeding greatness of the miracle involved in such a union. For our union with the Father is, is the Son himself And therefore, we're talking about Christ dwelling in you, Christ living in you. We're talking about new birth, being born from above and Christ living in you. I mean, now think about that. We're talking about the living word of God. John talks in his gospel, the living word of God. In the beginning was the word. The living word was God, with God, same in the beginning with God. By him all things were created. And honey, Peter comes along then and says, being born again, not of a corruptible seed, not of the seed of humanity in any way whatsoever. That's not being born again. There's no Humanity is not born again. No, no. Being born again by an incorruptible seed, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. Hunt, we're born again by the eternal word of God himself. Now, just get a hold of that. I'm about done. I mean, the scriptures say it, but we believe it. We know it if we know anything at all. We know that there's nothing, nothing created that he didn't create whether it was power, dominion, whether it was in heaven, on earth. Read that in the book of Colossians. Read it, and then it brings him right down and says, and not only has he created everything that exists, whether it can be seen or not seen, whether it is up or down, he created all things, and by him all things that he created remain and consist. And then it goes on and says, and not only that, He's the head of the body of Christ. Oh, my. Oh, you see, it comes to a point where we're not talking about an earth cre- a creation out here that we can see, a beautiful creation. I mean a beautiful creation. But it won't always bend that away. It'll die out there. But it's a beautiful creation. But the creation in Christ is far more beautiful to the eyes of our understanding. The greatest miracle, however, is that Son, that Word, that Christ, who created all of that, who said, let there be light. And it was was the Father by his word 
And by his word, saying all of that and doing all of that, But for that one who created all things to bring all of that into Christ, you remember reading in In Ephesians and Colossians, for we are his workmanship created in Christ. Un, too many things to be said, but let me tell you, It's not him making a better person out of you that counts on, I hope you're a better person. I want to be a better person. I mean, you, you know, yes, okay, fine. But listen to what I'm trying to tell me and tell you. There's more to it than me being a better person. It's a new person altogether. It's Christ the eternal, everlasting, my Lord and my Father, the eternal, everlasting Son of God, living in my soul, not living off somewhere else, waiting to come and or me to go there. That, 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 that won't hold. That won't hold. That won't hold anything. But it is, unfortunately, a teaching in much of the church world. But honey, everything Everything that is said to be so far in the future has already come in Christ himself because he is the greatness and the fullness of all of it. My Lord. But no wonder that Paul prayed and wrote that you may know who is the exceeding greatness of God's power that worketh in us. Think of it. The greatest power demonstrated, the greatest demonstration of God's power ever manifested, including the creation of the universe the sun, the moon, the stars. Therein, the creation of the world and all of his miracles done on earth or in the world, the miracle in, uh, involving the very creation of man and all of those things and all of those things fell short of the exceeding greatness of his power. All of those were, were at that time and are Acts of God outside of himself. They're all outward, yet they all speak. They all speak of a greater miracle than even than they are, of a greater, of all that 
that they are not. They all speak beyond themselves. They all do. Even the first creation, even, even Adam as a man, they all point to something yet to come. None of them were able to fulfill it. But all of that was outward. And yet the greatest miracle is not outward but inward, even in us. The greatest manifestation of the exceeding greatness of God's power is Christ dwelling, living, and abiding in you, in me, that is, in the believer. The miracle of which so many truly born from above ones have no understanding of at all. That miracle, that miracle is the foundation and the building of our fellowship with one another and the Lord's body because that miracle is Christ in you and you in him. You take Christ out of you, hon. Well, basically there is no body. There is no body of Christ. You take him out of the picture. Well, All right, let me leave you with this written in Isaiah for a good while yesterday and even, even this morning I thought, well, I believe I'll just start right here with this. And then I thought, no, you better not do that because it'll take you an hour to explain what it's all about. It's in Isaiah, and uh, let me see. It's in Isaiah. Uh Isaiah chapter 9. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, 
of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. We're talking about that new creation, honey. There'll be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice for therein, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. Unto us, A child is born, unto us a son is given. This is the same person, but it speaks of two relationships. Unto us a child is born. Well, then unto us a son is given. Now, I can't go anywhere with that right now because it was one of those things I I really, (laughs) Danny asked me about. I said, I haven't got any, I don't know. I I haven't got the slightest idea. I want to go with this one and this one and this one, and I'm not going to be able to do that. So I just mentioned to you about this view of Christ, the child and the son. The son is given. Now, I took a little time, I found out, in, 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 in one of, in, let me see, yeah, it's in one of these, one of these, one of these, one of these books, or, you know, one of these publications, The King, The Throne, and The Kingdom, and it has to do with that. It falls right into what we're talking about here, but the son is given. In the Hebrew language, written that there were most of the, you know the old covenant, the old the, the the Old Testament, in the Hebrew language, there's about forty five, no, there's close to fifty different words, English words, that can be translated as given. That many different, different words, different meanings of that word, about 50. And I looked at every one of them, brought them up, and looked at them. But there's only one of those words. That is, that is used in, in, in the New Testament, in the New Testament, with relation, with regard to the Son. And it's got to be something with regard to the Son. The Son is given. Then what does the word given mean? really mean in our language and come to be in our understanding. And and as I said, we we can we can look we can look that up. Uh, the word given in the Hebrew has forty or fifty terms that I didn't, that define it, but there's one term in the New Testament that identifies to the term given in the Old Testament and and that 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 word is found in Galatians 1:16 when it pleased God to reveal his son in me the word that I'm talking about here the word that I have said but there is the one term in the new testament that identifies to the term given in the Old Testament. Just one, but it identifies 
It identifies, in fact, I looked at it, there's three of these words over there. When the word given, okay. I may not be, I'm, I'm not saying it clearly. The word given in the Old Testament, unto us a son is, you know, a child is born, unto us a son is given. All right, the word given there has, uh, has in, in the Hebrew, it can be, it can be used, and there's about 50 different words that, uh, uh, that can identify with, with given, with the Hebrew word for given. And, and there, and it's used for about 50 other terms. A bunch of terms. But I noticed that in that there are three of those terms that do relate to what I've just read. They do relate to the New Testament term. One of them is that I can think of off the top of my head. One of them is to make known and the other is to show. To show. And then there's another one that relates to about the same thing. But all the rest of them, uh, I mean, one of them even talks about it's a name given to an Israelite somewhere. So what we have found here, and just let me read this, but there's one term in the New Testament that identifies to the term given in the Old Testament and it's found in Galatians 1.16 when it pleased the Father to reveal His Son in me. The Word is revealed. So we could actually read in Isaiah and we could properly read it in this way using this term and identifying it with another term that is in the Old Testament. So we could read in Isaiah and we could properly read it this way. A child is born, a son is revealed. <coughs> Your relationship with Christ as a son must be revealed by the Holy Spirit. You cannot know that relationship, that relationship any other way. And that's what Jesus told his disciples. Now you can argue with me about this until your tongue falls out on the floor. But it's the same thing that Paul declares. And so, Jesus said to his disciples, when he, the spirit of truth, is come. Well, how is it in me? How is it in you? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will take that which is me, mine, me, and show it unto you. He will glorify me. Sweetheart, all of that is true concerning Christ and is true in you and in me. But the spirit of truth opens our eyes to it and opens our heart to it and opens our soul to it. The spirit reveals a living reality. Christ who is already there. But in so many, so many circumstances, not understood, not known.
Well, all right. Newness of life? Well, that's Christ himself. That's the one who says, I am Alpha and Omega, beginning and end. He's always new. Yet he's always the same. Blessed be the Lamb of God. So he is our newness of life. And he is the exceedingly above and beyond all things, the greatest miracle of God living in your soul. That, that is truly to the natural mind unbelievable. Unbelievable. I've seen several natural minds in, in, in my lifetime and in my ministry. And this, this word, this gospel, I've, I've run into several that try to, you know, in their natural mind, they want to be, they want to be Jesus. And in their natural mind, they, they want that their outward body never die. And they try to put all of this as a spiritual reality, as Christ that is in, and, and they just, they just don't understand that salvation is not me living. It is Christ living in me. And it's not Christ in me as me. No, hon. <laughs> don't, don't go there and surely just really come on now. Don't, don't, don't be that way. Don't, don't be truthfully ignorant about that. Because, hon, where it was Christ as me and Christ as you was on the cross. Now that is where he took me and where he took you and that's where he took me and you and he was there as me, as you. And when he died, I died. I died. But the death who hear his voice and receive him shall live. They do live because Christ lives in them. So we've been talking about the new creation and the exceeding greatness of the one who lives in us. Because you see, who is the exceeding greatness of God, of, of, of the power of God? Well, it's, it's Christ himself. It's the word himself. He is the word of God's power. And he's in you and I. To know him, hon, salvation is about knowing him. It's about growing up in him. It's about he. working in us by His eternal Spirit. My, my. Thank you, Lord. Well, the Lord bless. That's far enough for us today. And what we're looking at, really, the grace of God. Because the grace of God is fulfilled in the person of the Son. Amen. So, we're finished with this session.